and we're going to jump into the number of political parties that we have. Yeah, it's it's, overwhel it's, it's good, it's, but it's, it's a lot. overwhelming. <laughs> but, but before we get there, I want us to chat about Youth Labs Manifesto and what makes it so different from the rest of the pack. Well, I mean, nobody's doing it like us. <laughs> um, I, there isn't a project of this kind yeah. um, that exists that I, I know of. So that, yeah. that is the one thing. It's a one of a kind. Yeah. Um, but I think what's, what's been very interesting about this project, um, and I think what sets it apart, is that we talk about young people a lot in South Africa. We don't talk to young people. Mm. And I think what's been so foundational for Youth Lab's work, Youth Lab has been around now for 12 years, um, and what's been so foundational to our work is that we, we center young people as the experts of whatever it is we're talking about, mm -hmm. right? So if, if I sit here and I say to you, young people are really prioritizing, are looking at mental health as an election priority, yeah. it's because I've spoken to hundreds of young people who have told me this, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't come from reading research or you know, watching the news and formulating opinions based on that. It's from actually going into communities and talking to young people. Mm -hmm. And it, it shows such, when we, when we did the manifesto in 2019, we held up what came out as the top youth priorities there to what we were reading in manifestos, Ooh. complete disju disjuncture, right? Because parties, who do parties talk to when they're creating manifestos? Nobody, they talk to themselves. <laughs> Right. So if you have, I mean, the ANC boasts, they tell us have, they have the biggest membership. Yeah. They're also not engaging their membership to create their manifesto. Mm. Right. It's a couple of researchers that work for the party sitting in a room deciding for all of us. Right. Mm. And what I like about the manifesto project is that it actually says, number one, young people have opinions. Right. Mm. They want to talk about the things that are going on in their communities. They care deeply about the issues that affect them, right? Every time I've been in this job long enough that it really great, like pushes me to violence now. Um, and <laughs> I know violence, we're, we're sitting in a very non-violent <laughs> area, but when people talk about how apathetic young people are, it makes mm. me want to physically fight them, right? Because all across our country, we see how much young people care. Yeah. But because they don't care in the same way you want them to, yeah. you turn around and go, oh my gosh, they're so apathetic. They just mm. care about their cell phones, all right. Sure. Perhaps maybe let me expand on your thoughts because, and I hope you don't come fight me. I'm <laughs> I'm but right. they say that <laughs> youth participation is at an all time low, right? Which I guess is also scary considering that the majority of this country is young people. Why do you think that is the case? So, I mean, the one thing I'll say, and it might sound flippant, but mm -hmm. everyone's participation is low. Nobody is sitting going, all of the over 35s have not been voting. Yeah. Oh my gosh, old people are so apathetic. Nobody's doing that, right? There's this pressure on young people to be the foot soldiers of demo a democracy that they also don't benefit from, right? So we must be the people who are here showing up at the polls, joining political parties, being at protests, doing all of this, but we don't have jobs. Mm, at what cost? At what cost, yeah. right? It's an extractive, this democracy is extractive to young people. Yeah. And so when they say, I'm not going to participate, it makes sense, right? Mm. Because why would you? Why would you want to be part of a democracy that doesn't serve you, right? You've been sure. told, and we do this every year around youth day, it's another thing I'm gonna start fighting people about, but we do this thing where we keep saying to young people, you know, look at the generation of 1976, everything that they fought yeah. for, everything that they've given to you, look at all this freedom that you have. Mm. And people go, freedom to do what sure. when we're sitting at home, right? Mm. When if you're a woman, you can only go out during the daytime. Yeah. You're like a you reverse vampire right. if you're a woman in South Africa, yeah. right? So freedom for what? You go to the police, they're completely incapac in, not, yeah, incapacitated they resources. to help you, right? There's no, there's no vans. Oh, you own, oh, right? There's definitely no vans. <laughs> there's no vans. <laughs> You need to do any kind of citizen admin. All the systems are offline, hmm. right? And, and I mean, these are very like whiny kind of things. But yeah. at a very structural level, right? You're yeah. a young person. You can't afford to go to university. Right? Half the young people that start grade one mm. don't get to matric. Don't mm. finish matric. Half. We lose half the kids. And then the ones that do finish matric, the percentage of them that can qualify for university 
becomes even lower. The percentage of them that finish, if we have to look at the numbers yeah. of the people that start grade one and the people that graduate with an undergraduate degree, you cry tears, right? Mm. So young people are opting out because they're saying, this thing is not working, bro. It's not working for us. We don't, there's nobody, you can't look at a party and have them mirror your life back to you, mm. right? People become politicians and they become successful in government and they are off living big lives, mm. right? There's, there's no reciprocity in this relationship that we have with our democracy. And so people are saying, I'm just not going to be a part of that. Now, whether that's, right or wrong mm -hmm. is not a useful conversation to have mm. because it's happening and it makes sense, right? It doesn't have to be right for it to be valid. Yeah. And I think right, young people and people across the board, right? It's, not, it's also not something specific. We had the lowest voter turnout since 1994 at the previous election. Mm. That wasn't just the fault of young people. Nobody showed up, right? Sure. And so I think putting all of this pressure on young people when they're not going to see the rewards of putting in the work that we're expecting of them is very unfair yeah. right and it's it's stupid it undermines the intelligence and the capacity of young people because it's saying pour into this country give everything you have and you're going to get nothing in return Zero. you'll maybe get nisfas maybe maybe yeah right your parents don't end we saw, a we saw today that oh, that was my my like vent session this morning yeah. where the SIU talked about recovering almost 900 million rand from institutions of higher learning of unallocated NISFAS funds. So students that deregister or they move universities that have been given NISFAS, that uh -huh. money yeah. has not gone back to NISFAS. Universities have been sitting on them. And now they've actually so even cut some students from, from funding for this year. Right, which is par for the course with NISFAS. I'm a NISFAS kid. I sure. know the struggles of yeah. never being sure if you're actually going to get that funding. Even when you sign that loan agreement, you don't know that that money is going to reach you, right? Sure. How many students could have gone through university? With that money. And, cause, and this was from, it was a five-year period, 2016 mm. to 2021, right? We're mm. not even now in this period because you know they were doing the most during COVID, <laughs> right? Yeah. How many students could have gone and finished university with almost a billion rand of universities just sitting on that money, right? Mm. You're gonna turn around to those kids and say, oh, but you're so apathetic, you don't vote. Yo. It doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make yeah. sense for young people to want to vote. And so, Yo. I understand why people opt out, but you, if you also then look outside of the issues, right? You look at what politics looks like, it's ridiculous. If you're voting, I'd said earlier that we, we vote on single issues, yeah. right? If you are a woman, so personally, mm. I would only like to vote for a woman going forward. I would if rather, we're being honest. If we're being honest, <laughs> I, think, I think the guys have had their chance. Yeah. They've had a good, they've had a, a good run. Yeah. Maybe give someone else a turn, right? Mm. If I, in the 2019 election, wanted to vote for a party that was led by a woman, yeah. remember I said we had about 46 options yeah but if i wanted to vote for a woman i had four choices if i wanted to vote for a young woman and even when i say young i'll expand if i wanted yeah. to vote for a woman under the age of 45 yeah i had no chances i had no options we what? don't have a political landscape that looks like us and it's not to say that only people that look like you can represent you right yeah you representation means different things yeah but I have more belief that a woman, for example, is going to hear me when I talk about how terrifying our rape statistics are mm. than a man, right? Yeah. We had a rapist for a president. We did that. I don't know if you she guys said I'm a that. Bitch. <laughs> but you, so you can't yeah. tell me that that running person for president also and that running. person's government yeah. is going to, and, and he's running for president again right yeah that person is going to take seriously the rape capital of the world you're joking but now how do we find ourselves in the situation then where we we don't have women at the forefront why are we here so many years i mean who was the last woman to even stand a chance is, is, well ndz ndz stood a good chance but i mean look and at their budget should, compared yeah. to the political parties that are heading yeah. elections right now yeah. 
where do they stand compared to, 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 to those parties? But it's part of our culture in South Africa, right? So another one of the questions we ask in the manifesto is would young people vote for um, a woman to be president? Ooh. And it's changed a lot since 2019. <laughs> But in every, sing, every single iteration of this, mm. you have a group of young people going, no, absolutely not. And why do you think that's the case? Patriarchy, right? We are a, we, South Africa is such a wonderful contradiction because we have this gorgeous constitution, yeah. right? Best, the Beyonce of constitutions, yes, truly. around the world. But we come from a deeply conservative country. Right. If you had to take a lot of our civic liberties now and put it to a popular vote, we would not live in the country that we live in. South Africans are deeply conservative. Sure. And we see it in, in, in many different facets of our lives. Right. What we've managed to do as a country is to say your personal beliefs can sit with you at home, but this is not the country we're trying to build, which is why sure. we don't do voting. We don't vote for policy based on like um, popular votes. Right. We won't say we're going to host, what do they call it? A, I can't remember, the word escapes me. But if we're saying we want to bring back the death penalty and everyone votes on that, we don't do that, right? Yeah. We have checks and balances mm. that create the society that we want. But South Africans are deeply conservative and patriarchy chows us and continues to, right? So, I mean, if you look at, I won't speak on it in, in names because... I'm not trying to catch any smoke on, <laughs> on the social. Because they're going to come for you. <laughs> but there was two weeks ago, I think, we had a very, very well-known young politician who was a woman who has had to talk about how her child was sick and she couldn't attend a session of parliament. And she was apologizing publicly for not being able to do that. And as her punishment, she had to buy her party two gazebos. It... <laughs> Yeah, take that a moment. That is no, very moment. strange. It's insanity, right? That's the political culture that you're saying. A young woman who is a very bright person, who has a lot of potential, who is very politically astute, is having to write public statements because her child was sick and has to tell you about how she has to now buy gazebos as penance for this. And then I must trust that that party should run my country. <laughs> Right, we sure. we are yeah. we're anti women mm. in every single way in South Africa. Right, mm. as a woman, try to do anything, try to report a crime, try to mm. like renew, try to walk on the street. Right, you we don't live in a country that believes that women are actually equal players here. Sure. And mm. so, and our politics, and that's the other thing, our politics reflects the society that we come from. Sure. And so, the fact that we live with a political culture that has no space for women, tells you about the state of the country that we live in, mm. right? Um, I'll share a quick story uh, as my last point for this. But we, at, at Youth Lab, we run a program um, with a brand that I won't mention on camera. <laughs> um, but we train spaza shop owners and we give them funding to kind of grow and sustain their spazas. Mm -hmm. And in the last four years, we've, we've done about 3,000 spazas in Gauteng. Nice. Now, the bulk of our participants, as in the people running the spaza shops, have been women. But all of the registrations, the bulk of, our, of the registrations of these businesses are men. So what happens is men will register their business, but then have their wives run it. But she has no legal standing in that business, even though she's the person that actually runs Puts it. In the that's patriarchy, right? And sure. that's... And it filters all the way through. So if you experience, the way you experience patriarchy in your home, mm. it checks out that you'd experience that at every single level of society. And so we, and, and outside of even women, right, finding a young person, a young person with a disability, mm. um, someone in the LGBTI community, right? There's so many pockets of representation that young people are looking for that we cannot find in politics, sure. right? And... It is a reflection of our society, but it's also who's going to change that, right? Mm. Um, and it's a very weird kind of cycle because I think we also created, we created a political system that's difficult to get into, right? It's expensive to register a party. Yeah. It's expensive to campaign. I don't have money to put posters on every single mm. streetlight in this country, yeah. right? So you've created something that's meant to be about people and for people and by people, but the people that are meant to do it can't 
actually be a part of it mm. unless you've got some people in Stellenbosch giving you money. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's not fun. It's kind of a yeah. mess. This is very depressing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can feel myself I like being have very a depressed. Happy conversation. <laughs> it's definitely not this happy. Is incredibly depressing. But speaking of these political parties, who funds them? Do you know? You want me to like <laughs> disappear tomorrow? No, I, I really want to know who funds them because I need to understand. I mean, what they've invested in these it's political a group of parties. The same people that fund everybody, right? Right. We talk about the the Stellenbosch mafia. We talk about people like the Oppenheimers. Yeah. They fund everybody, right? If you, we have the Political Pan Party Funding Act, which states yeah. that parties must publicly declare who their funders are. Mm. Now, they don't declare all their funders. Of course. Right? We don't get to see their bank statements. Mm -mm. Um, but we know they've got houses in Hyde Park. And... But we, we know the, 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 the suitcases <laughs> that get taken yeah. to the houses yeah, there in stand down, right? Mm -mm. Um, and so it's a, it's a small conglomerate yeah. of very, very rich people who fund everybody. You're hedging your bets, right? If you, mm. if you can bet on all the horses in the race, you win. Either way. And they have enough resources that they can do that yeah. and hedge their bets against people and then come in to cash in afterwards. So, and I, and I, that's, the other, that's the problem with the model that we use, right? Because it yeah. requires so much money. A random person, right? You could be the best candidate for, the pre for presidency, mm. right? You don't have the resources to go and do the work required to convince the rest of the country mm. that you are the best person for the job. And so what you have to do is take your hat and go to people that have money, but then effectively they are the candidate, not you. So, but surely then Pearl, then all of this loses credibility. The eruption of all these political parties just asking us for our votes, and then they are funded by the people that you mentioned. Surely, why are we doing this then? Who knows? I don't know. We don't have another option, I guess. We've not sat and talked about what. If democracy dies tomorrow, what do we replace it with? Right? And I think that's a conversation that would be nice to have, right? Yeah. Is what does an alternative to this version of our democracy look like? But we're not <laughs> we're not there, right? We're not yeah. you have the highest unemployment rate in the world. You can't sit and talk about how do we like a redesign democracy, right? Like you have to prioritize other things. Yeah. But that's kind of the thing, and I think that's also why globally, right, democracy is falling because South Africa is not exceptional, right? Across the world, this is what happens is a small group of elites fund and resource political parties so that their bidding gets done, yeah. right? So that I'm trading in gold and you're going to make my life very easy so that I can take all the gold from this country and send it away and then, yeah. you know, party with Oprah. So mm. it's... <laughs> It, 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 that's what global democracy looks like. It's yeah. a system of patronage. It's a system that is about who has the most money yeah. to effectively buy an election, yeah. right? Or if not buying an election, you're at least buying policy post-election. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a good conversation to have because you're right. Like, what, what, what do you do, right? Yeah. And you can come and sound very revolutionary and say, well, you know, if we didn't have capitalism, then... This wouldn't happen because then we wouldn't have billionaires, but that might take us in a very different direction. But, in this but, I, wanna, conversation. but I wanna put you on the spot now and, and, and say clearly we are seeing that democracy is not working. See, these are if, not if, my conversations. Nah. <laughs> these are not my conversations. <laughs> now, speaking on the spot because you are the pearl. Pena, that's why we brought you here. What is your solution? I, yeah, I don't know.